1999 is the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Curlin Collection at the University of Minnesota. Irvin Curlin was a medical doctor, a graduate of the University of Minnesota, and he donated his small collection, then small collection of children's books, manuscripts, and illustrations. In his lifetime, he acquired 6,000 books. The collection has now grown to 70,000 children's books with manuscripts and or illustrations for 8,700 titles. This is the 50th anniversary of the Curlin Collection here, but it's also the 25th anniversary of the Curlin Friends. And it is the Curlin Friends who award each year the Curlin Award. One of these award recipients in 1999 was Eve Bunting. Uh, hi, welcome to All About Kids. Today it's my great delight to uh, introduce you to uh, Eve Bunting, who is uh, one of the 1999 winners of the Curlin Awards for her distinguished and uh, prolific contributions to children's literature. Uh, welcome, Eve. Thank um, you, Patrick. Uh, I'd just like to start talking a little bit about your background. How did you, how did you begin as a children's author? I came, I was an immigrant, came immigrant. I came here from Ireland, as you did yourself. Right. And I just was suddenly faced with the fact that I was middle-aged and didn't know what to do with my life. Right. And I went to my local junior college and found a course in writing for publication, took it, and pretty soon sold a, a story to children's magazines and went on from there, right carried on. on from there. Okay. Uh, you were, uh, you were almost uh, amazingly prolific writer. You have nearly 200 titles uh, accumulated through your life. Um, how, what, what creates this, uh, this, this uh, prolific talent that you have? Well, you know, I think it's because I'm interested in everything. And I'm always watching. You know, there's a, there's a, a quote of someone's, I don't even know who it is, a writer was born watching. And I think that's true. And listening and feeling. Right. And so everything stimulates me. And sometimes I wish it didn't. It's like an obsession. Everything becomes an idea for a picture book. Right, right, right. And, and I have to write. Because uh, quite often it's a catharsis for me to write something right. that bothers me or right. hurts me. I, I write about it. Right. Uh, well, one of the first books I'd like to talk to you about is uh, Terrible Things. It's an allegory of the Holocaust. It's one of your earlier books. It's a 1980 uh, text. Um, and it's a really is a, it's a sort of a heartbreakingly, uh, heartbreakingly uh, poignant work. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about its background, what inspired sure. you to write it. Um, well, I had recently started writing when I did this. This is one of my very early books. Right. And um, I had come from Ireland, and I really didn't know anybody Jewish. I, you right. know, I, I went to a school that was just uh, being Protestant. It was all Protestant. Right. And um, I didn't know very many Catholics either, but I certainly didn't know anybody Jewish. And so um, I was done having lunch one time on Fairfax Avenue in Los Angeles when I saw these two women who were then about the age I am now, and they had the tattoos or markings right. from the concentration camps on their wrists and I began to look at them and listen to them and wonder what had happened to them in their lives and that started me thinking a lot about it and I knew basically right there and then that I wanted to do a book uh, for really young children talking about the Holocaust but right. knowing I wanted to do it and knowing how to do it were two different things so right, right. it took me a little while and I was able to translate it then into animals in the forest and tell it uh, in an allegorical kind of way, which was much easier than trying to do it with people. Uh, would you care to uh, read just a short section of that? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll read the beginning of it because I think that will give an idea of what, how the book, uh, how I handled the story. The clearing in the woods was home to the small forest creatures. The birds and squirrels shared the trees. The rabbits and porcupines shared the shade beneath the trees and the frogs and fish shared the cool brown waters of the forest pond. They were content until the day the terrible things came. Little rabbits saw their terrible shadows before he saw them. They stopped at the edge of the clearing and their shadows blotted out the sun. We have come for every creature with feathers on its back, the terrible things thundered. We don't have feathers, the frog said, nor we, said the squirrels, nor we, said the porcupines, nor we, said the rabbits. The little fish leaped from the water to show the shine of their scales but the birds twittered nervously in the tops of the trees. Feathers, they rose in the air, then screamed away into the blue of the sky. 
but the terrible things had brought their terrible nets and they flung them high and caught the birds and carried them away. And it, it is, I guarantee you, a, a story that will have your, your tear ducts working over time. It's a wonderful, it really is a wonderful uh, uh, allegory. The next book I'd like to talk to you about, which I see almost as an image of your entire writing journey, is called The Butterfly House. Um, and it's about, uh, it's about a, a girl and her grandfather mm -hmm. who, uh, who uh, raise and release uh, larvae until they become caterpillars. Could you, uh, until they become butterflies, excuse me. Could you talk about the background of that? Uh? Yes, in Pasadena where I live, we have a, a kids' space museum where they do all kinds of interesting things. And, and they send out little flyers. And one day they send out a flyer to kids to say, would you like to come and get a larva and raise it to be a butterfly and then release it on Earth Day? And so immediately, you know, never having outgrown the kids' stage myself, right, I right. went right down to the museum and I was like the only adult among all the six-year-olds and I got my larva and um, right. I followed all the directions and I raised my own painted lady butterfly and I felt really sad when it was time to go and release it just the way the girl does in the book. Right, right. So uh, that was the basis for this story. And since I wrote it, and it's, it's um, a 1999 book, I, it just came out. Um, I've had lots of people have different interpretations of what this means. Sometimes you write a book and you're just plain writing the book and then you find that people are reading a lot of things into it. Right. That, but it's wonderful and you feel very happy that this book has more depth than you really realized that it had. Right. Uh, having recently, uh, it was Easter quite recently and some people saw it as an allegory for the resurrection. Right. And, uh, right. Right. It is a it is a beautiful it is a beautiful image and it, uh, it's almost an image I see is right at the heart of what you're doing in your writing to try and kind of communicate this the idea of spiritual change or spiritual growth. Um, but one of the things you do, uh, perhaps you're f particularly famous for, is tackling sort of hard socially uh, thorny, socially socially difficult issues. Uh, and there's one of your books that you particularly do. Uh, again, a gut wrenchingly good job. If you don't mind me saying <laughs> so. Is uh, fly away home. Um, yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the background of Fly Away Home for us. Yeah, incidentally, quite a few of the reviewers say I tackle tender topics. Tender topics. <laughs> right. there we go. It's another way of putting it. Okay. Well, Fly Away Home had its genesis in an article that I read in the LA Times because I get that paper every morning and, you know, with my cup of tea, right. I have my, I have my <laughs> LA Times. <laughs> and I read a story about how in O'Hare Airport in Chicago, which is pretty far from California where I live, but right. it, I figured it probably happened in all airports. Uh, that the airport was actually filled with homeless people who tried to stay anonymous, uh, who wanted to live in there because it was a lot cooler in the summer than out in the streets of Chicago and it was a lot warmer in the winter time. Right, right. And, and I immediately I did what I, what I always do when I'm writing a book or thinking about a book, I immediately put a child in it and right. thought, okay, what would it be like for a child to live there with his parents? And so it ended up that I had a child there, a boy living there with his father and longing to have a home and, and wanting to get out of there and um, actually seeing a bird that flies into the airport and using the bird as his own simile for himself. Right, right, right. right, right. And, and, uh, how, and when the bird escapes the airport, he knows that, that he will escape it too someday. The door will open for him as it opened for the bird. Yeah. Right. Again, again, that image that sort of runs through your writing of the, the, the image of hope, of, of transformation. Um, another book that is, um, again, a, again, a very tender, a tender topic. A tender topic. <laughs> Let's talk about it very briefly. It's called uh, The Wednesday Surprise. It's a 1989 book, an early book for, for you. Um, uh -huh. I wonder if you could again talk about the background and reactions to, to The Wednesday Surprise. Uh, the background to this book, this book began when I was having a dinner one night with a friend in Sacramento who was a librarian and she was of Greek descent. Right. And she was telling me about how, um, telling me about her mother who was a real character and I hadn't met her but I always loved to hear stories about her. So my friend Penny said, you know, when I was little uh, I taught my mother how to read using picture books, using my own picture books. I brought them home. She couldn't read in English and I, I brought home my picture books. And Penny continued to talk and I of course with my writer's, right, right, head, right. Your writer's uh, head stopped her I stopped myself halfway with a fork to my mouth and stopped her right, and right. said please tell me about teaching your mother how to read and so I asked her to ask her mother's permission to write her story it's really Katina's story her mother's story and her mother said uh, you tell that author woman 
but if she needs more stories, I've got hundreds of them. Right. <laughs> so I had her permission and I wrote the book and she actually tormented me a lot wondering when the book was going to come out, when the book was going to come out. Right, right. But uh, the book has had a lot of, it was received very, very well because it's actually, it shows a child what a child can do uh, to help an adult and it's, it's, there's a little twist ending because all through it you really think, or at least the author hopes you think, that the grandparent is teaching the child to read right. or actually the child is teaching right. the grandparent to right. read. And um, shall I brag a little bit and tell you Certainly. that? Uh, Certainly, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. Shall I tell you that President <laughs> Bush has read this book on television right. and that actually Vice President Gore has read this book on television. This is not a political plug, this right, is just, no. he has been. <laughs> and, um, and Mrs. Bush wrote me a very nice letter about it, saying that how much she liked the book. So for a little picture book, it has uh, seen a lot of famous people right. <laughs> involved right. in it. And again, it's, uh, it's another book in which the, the caterpillar turns into a butterfly, in which the, there's that image of, of, there's that image of, of flight, of, of hope, of aspiration, which is... I like the way you do that. I must remember this. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but uh, one of the, one of the uh, another one of your books, which I think I, we can touch perhaps also on your exper experience as an immigrant, uh, or our experience as an immigrant, also, it's a book that focuses on the Greek-American experience. Um, again, it's a very recent book, it's a 1999 book. It's called I Have an Olive Tree. I wonder again if you wouldn't mind discussing uh, background. Not a bit. I'm, I'm absolutely amazed that you've got this book because I just got my very first copy. And uh, it was a, a strange experience for me because, of course, I hadn't seen the art since I don't do my own art. And um, you never know how a book is going to turn out. And when you're visualizing a book, of course, you visualize it one way. And it, it's never that way when you right. see it. It's because there's another head involved here, right, right, another right. heart involved right. here. And I hadn't, I'd thought of it being more of a photographic uh, sort of uh, story. And instead of that, it, it turns out to be this really beautiful uh, sort of, would you say, folk art? Yes. Kind of folk yes. art. Yes. Very, it's and very it's deep. really very nice. Uh, I was having, again, having lunch. I seem to do nothing but eat, but I was having lunch <laughs> with several booksellers. One day it was a sort of celebration lunch for one of my other books. I was sitting next to a bookseller who said to me, um, you know, I have an olive tree in Greece. And it was almost a repeat of my, my Wednesday surprise experience. I immediately stopped her and said, you have an olive tree in Greece? How did that happen? Right. And she said, well, my grandfather left it to me when he died. I've never seen it. And uh, my head immediately began turning a, in a picture book right. fashion. And I wrote this story about a little girl whose grandfather leaves her an olive tree in Greece. And of course, uh, he is also, when he dies, he leaves money for her to go see the olive tree. Right. And she thinks it's kind of silly. She really wanted to get a skateboard for her birthday. Right. She didn't right. want an olive tree. But when she goes to see this tree, she realizes, of course, that this tree is rooted a word I don't like, but I can never find another word. Um, it's rooted in, in Greece and all the traditions of Greece, and he really wanted her to go there to see how, how it had been for her family for years and years and years past. And of course, the, the idea of this touched me very much because actually, I have a tree in Ireland on Glenshane Pass. Oh, you do? Yes, and my mother, uh, we always called it my mother's tree, and we always went there to have picnics. We'd know where to meet at my mother's tree. And then they widened the road f uh, from Belfast to Derry, and they took away my mother's tree. Oh, my God. And the last time I was there, I planted another one. Oh, you did? Right where my mother's tree had been, yes. So when I wrote I Have an Olive Tree, I was really thinking of my own right. little right. Irish tree. It did resonate very much, I call it, the immigrant experience. What kind of tree do you have in Ireland? It's a little pine tree. It's a little pine tree. Yes. Okay. Again, no olives on no it. Olives. No <laughs> olives. I wonder if you could read the, the conclusion. The uh, conclusion? Certainly, I'd when, be happy to. When they have traveled to Greece uh, and fulfilled the, the, the dream of the uh, grandfather. And uh, actually, the little girl has brought, at the grandfather's request, some amber beads to hang in the tree. And so she does that. My fingers were fumbly as I unbuckled the backpack, took out the beads, and let them stream into my hand. They are like liquid gold, Mama said. Look how the sun traps itself in them. They are like big bubbles of honey, I said. I gave them to Mama. I can't reach. Grandfather wanted you to do it. She lifted me, and I hung the beads high on a branch. I watched the beads glitter in the sunlight, and then I pulled the tree's leaves around to hide them. Grandfather would be pleased, I thought. And I knew that this wasn't the only reason Grandfather had wanted us to come. It had to do with Mama and me and all of us being part of the island. He wanted Mama to remember again, and he wanted me to know. I did know. 
I'd never forget the island. Someday I'd come back. I tugged at Mama's hand. I have an olive tree, I said. Yeah. There's a wonderful image at the end of this book of the grandfather sort of hovering, hovering, levitating, his spirit yes. levitating over the olive yes. tree. It's a wonderful <laughs> piece of folk art. Um, well, sp speaking of the immigrant experience and your own experience as an Irish uh, person, uh, I, I just want to talk about a, uh, a book that has, that has a much more central Irish element to it, and that's uh, SOS Titanic. It's a, it's a book for uh, uh, young teens. It's a 1996 uh, short novel. I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about um, what, what attracted you to Titanic as a subject sure. matter. Well, I've always been fascinated by the Titanic. I think, again, that's the kid in me that lets me write kids' books. Right. Uh, you know, it's such a tragic uh, story. It's so dramatic. It has everything possibly going for it. And, of course, being Irish and living in Belfast, and which is for the Titanic was the crown jewel, really, right. uh, of the shipbuilding there, and also the, the terrible sadness. And actually, my father's husband worked in the uh, Harland and Wolfe Shipyard, oh, uh, not did? not when the Titanic was being oh. built, but okay. um, and which reminds <laughs> me of some some letters I get from kids. One of them wrote and said, "Were you on the Titanic <laughs> when it sank? <laughs> and then, were you saved?" <laughs> so I thought those were kind of that was a kind of classic letter. Right, right. But um, I always wanted to do a book on the Titanic, and uh, I was home in Ireland, and there was a um, exhibit in the Ulster Folk Museum of the Titanic artifacts and I went and saw it right. and just standing there looking at those glass cases that were filled with all these s sad sad memories of people who had drowned and the menus and the from right. that wonderful ship I decided I wanted to do this and as I started to do it and, s and I don't really um, ever sketch it out I just think it in my mind I began to evolve my characters and I realized that I wanted to put a little bit more than just the Titanic disaster in there, which was well known by everyone. Right, right. And then I, I put a, a rich boy and a poor girl, which was, it's such a prevalent situation in Irish villages, as I'm right. sure you know yourself, right, right, right. that class conscious thing. And I put that in, and this, I would tell you that this book was written way before the movie, The Titanic, right. uh, and, and it did very well. But then James Cameron came up with his, right. which had a rich, girl and a poor boy, it was the other way around. Right, right, right. And um, once he did that, this book really rocketed up because I think maybe a lot of kids thought it was the movie or it w the interest was, was, was invoked there, right. yeah. Right, right. So um, the book has done really very, very well. Um, it's a book I love myself because I, I always love books that have an Irish, uh, some kind of an Irish background to right. it. It takes me home even when I'm not there. Right. In this book, we have Barry O'Neill, and we have the Fighting Flynns, and he's, uh, Barry O'Neill has been accompanied by this odious sort of guardian character yes. called uh, <laughs> Scullins, I believe. Right, right. Yeah. Where do the characters come from? Where do these... these uh well, they really just come out of my imagination. As I start to think about the book, I visualize the cast of characters all around the woman with the hat, you know. And right. Uh, they she, just that's a wonderful character, because she takes this great delight in the fact that there was the book, the novel, Futility was written, right, which... Right. Right. The, the liner Titan, the unsinkable Titan, 15 years before, yes. was predicted that uh, she yes. so she torments her husband. That's there's some wonderful comic scenes there where she's tormenting her husband. It was quite an amazing thing that other book being That's written. Right. Uh, That's right. The, 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 the story of the t Titanic has really everything. I don't mean my book necessarily, right, but right. the overall story of the Titanic, the sinking of the Titanic. Right. Uh, so the Barry O'Neills and the Fighting Flynns, that was a way to bring in the different the, the yes. class, the class yes. elements. Yes. Uh -huh. I, I thought because that was very important, as you know, at the time of the Titanic sinking. <coughs> and I have read that a lot changed after that. Right. It was kind of a watershed, no pun intended right, there. Right, right, right. Yeah. I know, another, another book that touches on your, uh, your, your sensitivity to different cultures um, is a book that covers the Japanese-American experience during the, the Second World War called So Far From the Sea. Um, I wonder again if you could just talk about why what made you fascinated with that topic? Um. Well, again, living in Ireland in World War II, if the, the war, when it touched us, touched us with Germany, it didn't touch us with Japan right. as it would have if we'd lived here. And I didn't really uh, know or understand this business of uh, taking uh, Japanese Americans and putting them into internment camps. Right. It was a very foreign idea to me. Uh, and I really began to think about it first when my husband and I were driving from Pasadena, uh, our son skis in Mammoth, and, and um, 
and it's maybe a four or five hour drive up from Pasadena to Mammoth and he had a condominium up there. So we would go up to visit him and we would pass uh, the old deserted camp of Manzanar right. where all these thousands of people were kept right. interned during uh, World War II, Japanese Americans. And so one day I said to him, let's just go in here and have a look at it. And so we went in and we passed the obelisk with all the, the memorial written in Japanese script and walked through and it was just so hard to imagine. It was bitterly cold and, right, right, and right. deserted and, and we were the only people there, but people had been there before us because there were some wilted flowers and uh, left uh, as memorials. And so um, we went back twice and I took my notebook and pencil and, and began to think about it. And then I, they have a museum up there where they have letters from people who were in the camp. Right. And then I actually find a young woman whose father had been in the camp. And um, there's a story in this about how uh, the little boy in this book, his parents, when the soldiers come to take them away to the camp, his parents say, put on your Boy Scout uniform because then they will see you're a true American and they won't take right. you. Right, that's a tremendous image there. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and yeah. of course they took him anyway. And this young girl told me this, that her father had actually had that experience. Right. He had dressed in his uniform. So it actually seems to me once you start opening your mind and listening to what people are saying and, and allow yourself to be moved by all the all the wonderful things and all the horrible things that are in the world around us, well, there's just an awful lot to write about and that's why I write so many books, right. I guess. Is there any uh, any uh, ideas percolating at the moment? Oh, always. Always. <laughs> I am never without a book in my head. <laughs> oh, you are. What's currently on the and what's currently on the drawing board? Right well, now, uh, you will find this very odd, and I'm finding it very odd myself. Again, it's another tender topic. I'm actually trying to do a book about uh, a little boy and a little girl who are who have to be taken from their home in Kosovo oh. and moved. Right. That fits into the whole pattern of your. Uh, well, right. I see it on my television every night, and I see those children. I see those children's faces. Right. And I just want to write about them. I haven't yet discovered how to do this. Uh, tender topics are a little difficult sometimes because right. you have to just get the right note. Right. Uh, I find that if I get the first two lines, then I'm pretty much underway, but it's right. just getting that start that's hard. Uh, do you keep in touch with the instructor or instructors you had when you took that writing class? She was the most wonderful woman, but she died uh, maybe about seven or eight years ago. Right. And the nucleus of her class, we still meet. Oh, you do? Uh -huh. Wonderful. We're all pretty well published by now, and we meet and, and uh, just have a little meeting. Uh, Is it a wide variety of different, different subjects? It's of all children's. All children's? All children's books. Okay. Um, well, that, there's one more book. Again, can continue with, there's one more book that really resonated with me. Again, I think it was probably because of the, the folk art quality to the, to the, uh, the illustrations. Um, and I do want to talk to you a little bit about your illustrators. And that's called Smoky Nights. Um, and that co covers a little bit of the, the background of the LA riots. Yes. Again. Um, and again, it's part of the diversity. There's a certain underlying consistency of uh, sort of this, this trying to find an insight or a point of growth in your stories, even though this, this, despite the fact that there's an enormous diversity of topics that you cover. Again, I wonder if you could uh, talk about um, what, what attracted you to Smoky Night. Smoky Night. Uh, Smoky Night, uh, well, that was a terrible night. Right. The night of the Los Angeles riots. And we live in Pasadena, which is maybe 10 miles from the center of Los Angeles. Right. And we could hear, we could smell the smoke, we could see what was happening, we could see it on our television. And actually in Pasadena, several blocks were raised and burnt and looted. And so, uh, again, I began thinking of a child. I always instantly right. put a child into right. it. And I, I thought of a child maybe standing at a window uh, on one of those big apartment buildings downtown Los Angeles, looking down onto the street where all this was happening and saying to his mother, um, somehow I visualized him right away as being a single, uh, a child of a single parent and ha asking his mother, what's happening? Why are these people doing this? And, and uh, and so I, I just thought about it a lot. And I don't know, the cats are used here uh, to show what I want to say, really, right. to say what I want to say. I said through the two cats. But this book, as you may know yourself, had quite a bit of controversy. I think maybe if it hadn't won the Caldecott, it wouldn't have been such a controversial book. It might have just disappeared into the haze. Right. But because it won the Caldecott, it, it pulled it forward. And um, it was considered to be very controversial because children don't really need to know about riots, I think was the rationale for that. Right. And I don't go along with that rationale in anything to do with children because I think they know and I think they're very open-minded and I think that 
they're much smarter than a lot of adults give them right. credit for. And I know this to be true from the letters I get from children on Smoky Night. Right. Um, and again, it's that by facing a harsh topic, or by looking, if you like, at the, at the legs of the caterpillar or the, the, the spiny back of the caterpillar, you're able, to, you're able to bring forth the sort of this image of the butterfly inside the caterpillar. And even though, even though there's nice. even though there's this ethnic division or sort of hostility between the sort of the different uh, communities in Smoky Night, again you manage to bring the through the through the agency of the cats you bring the two communities together. It's it's, a, it's a quite a beautiful uh, image. Um, the very last book I want to talk about. May I just tell you one Certainly. thing about this? One child wrote to me and said, "I think you told two stories in this book. You told about the riots and you told that blacks and whites and others can come together if they only try." I think we should try. Right. That's the kind of thing makes me feel glad I write a book like right, this. Right, 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 yeah. right. Um, uh, the last book that I want to just very briefly talk about, um, which surprised me because I, even though I read it nearly twice trying to find the, trying to find the caterpillar, it's nearly all <laughs> butterfly. It's called Night Tree. It's very yeah. sweet, uh, somewhat simple, sweet to the story. Um, again, surprisingly simple for, for one of your books. I wonder if you could just talk about uh, Night Tree, which is a 1991. Sure. Uh, text? I have to do some, you know, lovely, charming <laughs> books sometimes. <laughs> right, right. I can't just always be on my tender topics. Right. And it's really surprising. I do quite a few books that are not tender topics, but the tender topics are the ones that get noticed right. so much. Right. So right. this was one of those I had, um, I'd been up actually up in this part of the woods, up in Minnesota, right. I believe it was. And I was talking with some teachers, and they told me that this was something that they did with their classes, go out and find a tree out in the forest at Christmas and decorate it for right. the animals. Right. And so I decided that was a story that needed to be told. Not a tender topic, but a tender story. Right. <laughs> well, it's been a great pleasure talking to you today. Uh, Eve Bunting, uh, award winner of the Curlin Awards and for her outstanding contributions to children's literature. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Eve Bunting was the keynote speaker for the Curlin Award 1999. Eve Bunting has written more than 150 children's books, and she has given to the Curlin Collection a number of manuscripts for those books. She and her husband came from Ireland, where they had lived and raised their young children in 1960. She has used Ireland as the setting for some of her stories. There are folk tales from the Irish tradition, many of which she remembers from her father telling her those stories. The Curlin Collection is the place that people visit to see how a book was written and how a book was illustrated. Eve has had many illustra illustrators through the years. She's such a favorite amongst those artists because they start with a very well-written story and their imagination takes hold and they can interpret the story as they wish. We invite you to come to the Curlin Collection to see the Eve Bunting books and the manuscript drafts. These you can see at the University of Minnesota Libraries. <laughs>